Well, after a series of lies, cover-ups, and fabricated stories, Emmett has finally come to confess in an extremely satisfying episode. Hey guys, it's Kevin Mark for Fargo, Season 3, Episode 9, Aporia, and I was definitely really looking forward to this episode, especially after the way the last one left off, but I also was very interested because of the time jump, which as I told you guys, I don't think was exactly necessary. I understood, obviously, the guilt was getting to Emmett and things like that, but there were a lot of things that I just kind of felt like it was in there, like I didn't really feel like we necessarily needed this time jump, um, but I was really interested in seeing where it was going to go, and... This episode, holy shit, was this good. I mean, this was without a doubt one of the best episodes of the season. I still think episode 6 is the best. I think it's going to be hard for anything to compete with that. Maybe the finale we'll have to see, but this episode was so satisfying in every way because finally people are starting to tell the truth. Uh, we're finally getting some closure of things, and I really love the way this episode was done. I think there was just some fantastic stuff going on here. Um, you know, Carrie Cooney McGregor especially really did not get out of the park this week, but let's just get this episode because I definitely do want to get into it, and we start off, we see Marvin Stussy, who again, we know he's a Stussy, so immediately we know that he probably is going to be a target. He is of St. Cloud, Minnesota, quietly going after his morning routine, and he fetches his newspaper, and he prepares his breakfast, and in the middle of doing that, he's suddenly stabbed to death by Mimo, who is looking, you know, he's looking into his refrigerator, and Mimo just casually stabs him, and it was honestly really funny the way that it was done. Um... But now another Stussy is killed, and we finally get an answer towards that, but we don't find out what that is till the end. I'll get into that a little bit later on, but there is, in fact, a connection to all of the Stussy deaths, and, uh... At this point, it seems that Yuri's gone, because Mimo is working for, um... Varga, and there's no mention of Yuri. We don't actually know what happened to him. There was, like, a brief mention that he might have bled to death from his injury, but we don't actually know if that's true. Maybe he fled the country. I mean, we don't really know what could have happened to Yuri, but Yuri, I'm guessing, is uh, is done with the show. I guess we're just not going to see him throughout the rest of the season, which was fine. Again, I, I just... Yuri and Mimo are not characters that I really found myself that invested in. I think they did some good stuff with Yuri towards the end, but I don't think they developed those characters enough for me to really care about them um, in the way I do with an Emmett or a Nikki or, you know, a Gloria. I really love these characters because of how well they were developed. I don't think Mimo and Yuri were nearly as well developed as those characters were. Um, but then we get to the way last week left, the way the last episode left off, and uh, this was incredible. We see Emmett, he's finally turned himself in, and he prepares to be interviewed by Gloria. And although three police stations are closer, he wants to speak with Gloria because she gave him her card. And he knows very well that Gloria is someone that, you know, has known what's going on, and he's tired of, you know, lying to her. And he begins by telling her anyone who claims to be his lawyer should not be let in. Of course, you know, that being Varga, that being anyone like that, just don't let them in because they're just going to tell a spew of lies. And, you know, he's tired of it. He just wants people to say the truth. And he doesn't want to speak to anyone and says, don't trust anyone who comes if they do, which they may not. And Emmett admits after so many um, episodes that Ray was actually right and that he did trick him out of a fortune and that their dad played tennis every Saturday. And on one such day, Emmett was in the driveway throwing a ball against the house and Ray was inside eating. So their dad returned home, he stepped out of the car, and he fell to the ground dead. So yeah, now we know really what happened to their dad. He literally just fell to the ground one day and... Basically, Emmett attempts to keep his emotions under control as he tells a story, and he just randomly blurts out that he actually did kill Ray. And uh, I love the way this was done. I love that this was such a scattered story because, you know, Emmett is trying to keep his emotions in check. You know, he's trying to, um, you know, stay calm about this, but he just can't. You know, he's done that for so long. He's tired of living in this fantasy. He just finally needs to let his emotions out and... That's what made the scene even more effective, the fact that finally, after so many episodes, he's finally getting to just let it all out, and I love that here. I really did love um, the way this was done because of that. So he missed the glory. The first he tricked him, then he killed him, and even though there were years in between the events, it was like no time had passed 
when he killed Ray in his apartment. And it makes sense, too, because this feud has been ongoing for many years. And Emmett then asks Gloria if she believes that there's a special level of hell for those who kill loved ones on Christmas Eve. And she doesn't respond. Like, you think she's going to say something, but she doesn't. And he reveals that at 17, he wanted his dad's stamps and uh, not his red Corvette. He hinted to his chubby brother he'd actually get laid for the first time if he had the car. And Ray then begged uh, Emmett for the car as was as if it was his idea. Like, he made it seem like this was his idea. Like, he wanted this car all to himself. And Emmett feels horrible for tricking his brother. Because remember, he gave Emmett the car in exchange for him getting the stamp. And Emmett feels horrible for this and for cutting his throat, leaving him to bleed out on the floor. And I love that Emmett's just finally coming to the conclusion that this all just kind of escalated from there. It all started when Emmett took that stamp and gave Ray his car. And Glory then asks for more details. And Emmett explains that he saw Sold all but the two cent stamp to start and fund his business. He framed the two cent stamp, but knows that that stamp was like a stick in the eye. Every time that Ray saw it, that's all he would see. He wouldn't see Emmett, he would just see the stamp. That was the MacGuffin that he needed, and that was kind of the MacGuffin that drove a wedge between these two brothers. And it was a stamp that meant that Emmett had won and that Ray had lost. And that was something that Ray just wasn't okay with. He could not accept the fact that he had lost. And that's something I did like, is that Emmett's not the only one responsible. Ray, I think, is just as responsible because he just couldn't accept the fact that he um, was, you know, he lost this and that this was Emmett's. And he recalls the events of the night that Ray died, beginning with how he brought the stamp to Ray and apologized. And Emmett wanted to sell the feud once and for all. Unfortunately, Ray wasn't looking for any pleasantries because he was still mad. And that's when the frame broke in the glass, then pierced Ray's neck. And Emmett says, he didn't mean to do it and he didn't hit him with the frame it just happened but he's not saying it wasn't murder as he believes that he's been slowly killing his brother for 30 years and this entire story after hearing everything it actually makes a lot of sense like i can totally understand um you know, the, the way I was, I, I totally understand why Emmett really does feel the way. Sure, you know, he physically didn't kill his brother, but mentally and psychologically, he messed him up to the point where Ray was just, you know, okay with it. And he just kind of let it happen. You know, he, he would have just, um, cooperate with Emmett and, you know, stepped a few, you know, if he would have been in a better state of mind and not been as erratic and, as, um, you know, impulsive as he really was, I don't think Ray would be dead right now, and I think Emmett's just kind of realizing that it all kind of escalated from that. All of these years of hatred, all of these years of regrets, all of these years of Emmett becoming successful and Ray not have really just built up and really put things into perspective, and I really did love the way the scene was done here. Ian e. McGregor really just killed everything about this scene. By having Emmett, it's really gotten us to rationalize with him more and sympathize with him, and I think they did a really great job with that here. So meanwhile, Mimo then meets with Varga in the 18-wheeler parked in the Stussy lot, and Varga reminds him what matters is that Emmett signs the papers, because obviously, that's what's going to give them full control. We I've said it before, Varga does not give a shit about Emmett. He just wants to take everything from him, and that's it. And Emmett's just kind of okay with it, because he promised Emmett that he's going to get, you know, he's going to make him very, very wealthy. And they also have to get Emmett out of the police precinct ASAP, which you know isn't going to happen. You know, Emmett's not going to let that happen, so... Varga then takes off. Mimo, accompanied by a small assortment of goons, they leave the lot. He drives the 18-wheeler, and he's in the 18-wheeler with one associate who two other fall who two others follow close behind in a car, and they're stopped at a red light. And when suddenly the passenger side window crashes in, Nikki is standing right outside the door, and this was such a good reintroduction because I had no idea that um Nikki was, you know, I had no idea what Nikki's whereabouts were. Obviously, we saw Nikki. After what ended up happening, you know, we didn't see Nikki after her whole encounter with Paul. So seeing her again here was just so satisfying to see how hellbent she is on revenge. Because, yes, Emmett, you know, is technically the reason that drove the reds between the brothers. But Varga's the reason for all this happening. I mean, he's the one that told Emmett to lie. He's the one who fabricated the story. He's the one who got them into this mess in the first place. You know, he's the one who wanted Emmett to sabotage things with his brother. He's the one that wanted Emmett to betray Sai. All of this is really stemmed from Varga, and Nikki knows very well who the real, uh, cul you know, who really should be held culpable for this. So she's standing right outside the door. She tosses in a grenade just casually. Mimo then leaves from the truck, and he takes cover in a nearby pickup while Mr. Wrench then opens 
Roman's fire on Vargas men in the car, and I loved seeing these two work together. It's just awesome, and she jumps in the truck driver's seat. We realize that it's a fake grenade. Like, it's just actually a paperweight, which is just so awesome, and her and Mr. Wrench drive away with it out the window, and I love that she just tosses it mercilessly, not even caring, because it's not even real, and uh, basically... They drive the truck to what looks like a salvage yard, and then check out what's in the back, and Vargas then completes monitoring his setup is there with its computers, cameras, etc., and Nikki doesn't really say anything. She just kind of goes about it, and they look around inside. They grab a briefcase, books, and hard drives before leaving. They get into a car mere feet from the truck, and they take off, leaving the back door of the truck wide open, and we realize that Nikki meticulously planned out this entire attack. Like, this obviously was done so they could take hold of the truck, and this is kind their first step in taking vengeance against Varga. So, Mimo then makes it back to the Stussy Lot's office just as Varga receives a call from Nikki, and he quickly figures out who he's talking to. And in response, she calls him by the name of one of his Cayman Island account numbers and lists off one more account number and... He's briefly shocked, the fact that she's able to do this, but, and I love that, like, she's actually beating Varga, like, this is the first time someone's actually challenged Varga in this way, I mean, he didn't think it could be done, but he recovers enough to tell her numbers mean nothing without passwords, and the answers to six security questions, and she demands to know what the VM stand for, and tells him that she wants two million to be delivered to the lobby of the Clarion Hotel, reminding him to come alone, so obviously, you know that she definitely has some sort of dark plan for um Varga. We don't exactly know what that entails yet, but just seeing Nikki so hellbent on revenge is so satisfying. You can tell that she's not just gonna let him go. Sure, yes, she did in fact have um you know, she had um the one guy killed, I can't even think of his name now, but DJ Qual's character, you know, she had him killed she, Gollum, she had Gollum killed. But that doesn't mean she's going to let Varga and Mimo just go into the night. She's going to make sure that they get their, you know, they get what's coming to them. And I really did love seeing that. And again, spending all this time with Nikki, it's just made us so satisfied. This could easily have been just something so random, like, oh, why is Nikki doing this? But after seeing everything she's done, this is exactly the right course of action to take. And it's just so satisfying for finally someone to actually challenge Varga and be on the same level as Varga even. It's just so well done to see, and I can't wait to see where this ends up taking us into the finale. So back at the station, Emmett's an escort to a holding cell, and while Gloria gives Winnie a call, Winnie's then out at a crime scene, She after and after Gloria asks about her com uh, conversation with Ruby Goldfarb at the restaurant the night of Ray's murder, Winnie had news of her own to share. Basically, there's a dead man in his kitchen with his throat cut by a piece of glass, and the weird thing is his last name is Stussy, of course, that being Marvin Stussy, which we saw in the beginning of the episode, and... Gloria's son, Nathan, that shows up at the station with lunch for his mom. They're discussing upcoming weekend plans when Goldfarb calls saying she'll come in for an interview and Gloria's happy about how the case is moving along and believes that she's close to closing it because now she knows what's going on here. She knows that Emmett's responsible. She has all the details that she needs and I like that Gloria is, you know, successfully trying to close it. Like, she's just not just going to let this case remain wide open. She's going to make sure that it is closed and... I love seeing that determination and the fire in her. I've talked about this before, but that's one of my favorite parts of her character, and uh, I think it's just really great to see. So, we see Chief Damick. He arrives at a different crime scene where a man is sitting in his kitchen dead. He's taped to a chair and has his nose and mouth glued shut, and his name is George Stussy. And Chief Damick then thinks that all these Stussy deaths were committed by one person, that a neighbor wrote down the license plate of a maroon catalog that left the scene in a big hurry. But that's obviously not the case. Chief Damick could not be more wrong. I mean, these have all just been kind of random, like, just, it's been the name Stussy, I guess, just is, is associated with murder, but the cops then find the killer at a gas station, he's taken into custody, and they think that he has to be the killer, like, he has to be the one responsible for this, so, basically, Ruby isn't happy, um, about being called for additional questioning, putting on an attitude as Gloria attempts to get to the truth about her dinner date with Cy and Emmett, and as they're going over the timeline for the dinner, there's a rush of activity in the station. Gloria checks it out, and Chief Damick is overjoyed and proud of himself that he actually solved the murder. And again, Chief Damick feels like he did it all. Like, it's solved, there's no reason to continue. But Gloria doesn't understand since Emmett just confessed. Why are they, you know, why they get this guy since Emmett just confessed to them? But Damick insists that all the murders were committed by a man who hated the Stussies, and that the killer had a stockpile of evidence from each of the murder scenes in his trunk, and he confessed to all the murders. 
years. So again, Gloria is just not letting her voice be heard as usual. You know, she's just not being heard as usual. He's just ignoring her, and he's not really letting her. Um, explain what's really going on here, because obviously, that's not what's going on. Gloria knows very well what's going on. She's got all the details. You know, she has everything they need. I've said it before. Gloria and Winnie have been way ahead of Chief Damick for a while, but Chief Damick just can't um, you know, he just can't not win. Like, he can't think of the idea of Gloria actually being smarter than him. Of, you know, how can Chief Burgle, who's now Deputy Burgle, actually be smarter than me? There's no way that could possibly happen. So, obviously, Damick feels that, you know, he's kind of outnumbered, when in reality, he's completely wrong about this. So, Mimo then informs Varga that Emmett will be let out soon, and that the operation is moving to Stage 5. And we don't know what that means, but... Varga's very overconfident. He meets Nikki in the hotel lobby, ready to hear her demands, and I genuinely thought that he was gonna kill her. Like, I thought Nikki was gonna die in this episode, but they verbally spar, and Nikki then ho more than holds her own. She describes why she loves playing bridge, and he expresses his detest for games, and he offers her tea, which she wisely refuses. You could tell that he was obviously going to try to poison her, just like he did with Sai, but Nikki knows the way that they work. I mean, she's obviously, you know, she's given in to Mimo and Yuri before. She's not gonna do it again, and instead of handing over the money, he offers her a job, and is impressed when she calls him on his line of bullshit about being in middle management. He adds a zero to her salary offer, and still, she refuses. She's not just going to work for him, because she knows that's what he wants. And again, I love the fact that she is directly challenging him here. Who would have thought that someone would do that? But he wonders what Nikki's game plan is, and she lays it all out, that she's not sure the briefcase he's carrying has the money in it, but she is sure that Mimo is somewhere close by watching him and ready to shoot her if she hands over the books and the hard drives. And that's exactly the case. He's actually listening on this from a floor above, rifle aimed at Nikki's head, so she knows very well how this is going to go. And she continues laying out her plan, saying that Varga is a distinctive looking guy, and this is a public meeting spot. But when he tells her to look around, every single man in the lobby is dressed exactly like him. And she compliments the move, while at the same time, Mr. Wrench has located Mimo and holds a gun just inches from the back of the assassin's head, and, uh... I kind of got the sense that he told her that this, you know, this is surrounded by me, there's too many powerful men, you're just outnumbered here. Uh, but basically, we see that, you know, he holds a gun inches from the back of the assassin's head. Mr. Wrench signals Nikki through her earpiece. She lays out her cards on the table, telling Varga that his men has been spotted, and it's no longer a part of the equation. So she demands her money as Varga confirms for himself that Mimo is no longer covering him, that he's now on his own here. You know, she's, you know, that's, she has to go through him. And Varga wants his property, but Nikki threatens to turn one hard drive over the police since he didn't comply with her demands. I mean, that's not what she said that she wanted. So Varga warns her that she can't win this game, reminds her that she's asking for petty cash while he's offering her a fortune. Remember, Varga's always won here. I mean, you know, Emmett's given in, Sai's given in, Nikki's the first person who isn't giving in to Sai, and Sai, you know, I mean, who isn't giving in to Varga, and Varga just doesn't like it. And Nikki then reveals the kicker to this plan, that it's all about hurting him, not the money. She doesn't care about the money. All she cares about is making sure that he suffers and he tells her that Emmett actually killed Ray, but Nikki knows that Varga was behind the attempt on her life in the jail. You know, she's not just gonna, you know, listen to that, because she knows that he was the one behind it all and flipping the bus, and he admits that he doesn't like her, and Nikki's fine with that. She's not looking for him to like her, so she gives him another day to get her money, and then casually walks out of the lobby along with Mr. Wrench, and everything about that scene was so well done. I love the fact that Varga is not winning. I love that, you know, Nikki is not falling for his bullshit. Finally, someone is not just giving in to Varga, which is something that he's so used to. You know, he was ready to offer her a job, but she was just not going to take it. And the fact that Varga is, in fact, kind of threatened and intimidated by Nikki is really interesting. And it really makes me interested in seeing where this is going to go in the finale. I don't know if Nikki is actually going to win over Varga, but I could possibly see that happening based on the way this confrontation went, the way it was so planned out, the way she told him specifically what she wanted. He knows exactly what she wants from him, and who knows this is actually going to go in Varga's favor for once. I honestly think that Varga's wrath might be ended by Nikki, and I can't wait to see how that happens. Back at the police station, Gloria is then ordered to let Emmett go, and he's just as confused as she is. Like, 
why is this happening? Why is my being let go all of a sudden? And she explains what happened since he's been locked up, and that a serial killer who hates people named Stussy has in fact confessed to all the murders. And Emmett can't believe that people were killed just because they share his last name. I mean, that makes no sense. And Gloria asks who's pulling the strings, acknowledging that she believes that it was the man she met in his office. And Emmett's about to say something and stammers a little before apologizing. He doesn't divulge into the puppet master's name. I think because he's so scared that Varga could come after him. And he's not like Nikki, who is, you know, who knows how to play this game. He's He's more calculated than that. Nikki, I'd say, is still calculated, but he knows that he can't beat Varga. That's something that Nikki can do. I don't think Emmett can beat Varga, and I think he very well does know that. And Gloria simply opens the door, sets him free. You know, she's gotten what she needs from him. I think you can tell that Gloria is feeling very unsatisfied. Like, she knows very well that Emmett's the one that's responsible. Um, but... Unfortunately, because of Chief Damick, you know, being the one in charge, she kind of just has to follow protocol, and that's not what she really wants to do here, so... Mimo's been waiting outside to pick him up. Emmett looks like a dead man walking. I mean, he, at this point, he knows that he could possibly die. He knows that if he outed Varga, then he definitely is going to be dead. He sits next to Varga in the back seat of the car, and Varga explains that the problem is not that there's evil in the world. The problem is that there is good. He feels that everyone should be evil. He feels that evil will benefit them. And Varga does have a point. Like, him being evil and intimidating and as boisterous as he is has made him highly successful. Successful, but that's also what's made so many people so fearful of him and that's also what's made Nikki not afraid of him because of the fact that she herself um knows how he's thinking and knows that she just she's not going to give in to him like that so in many ways yes it has helped him but it's also been I think his weakness at the same time so after rough day we get this incredible scene with Gloria which I know I talked about it before, but Carrie Coon is one of the best actresses um, of our time right now, and scenes like that perfectly outline that. We see she's meeting up with Winnie at a bar, and Gloria believes that the good guys have lost, which is very much true. I mean, they knew very well what's going on here, but she's really not feeling satisfied. Yes, the case is closed, but to her um, dissatisfaction, she knows very well who the real culprit is, that Emmett is the one that should be in jail right now, but Winnie says that Jesus does win in the end and glory then talks about the sci-fi books that her stepdad wrote and that she felt like the android in his stories and we finally start to see the connection here that she really did feel like that robot that said he could help but wouldn't do anything and she also confesses to feeling unreal that automatic doors don't open for her sinks and soap dispensers they don't work for her and no one hears her when she makes a phone call nothing i mean nothing seems to work for her whatsoever and she believes that she doesn't actually exist because no one really does listen to her and it makes sense i mean chief damick he hasn't listened to a thing she said not many people the police have listened to her winnie's the only person that's really genuinely listened to her and she pokes her and then instead of making a speech she tells gloria to actually stand up and she does and for the first time, she, Gloria gets something that I don't think she's gotten in years. Winnie gives her a very genuine hug, and it's exactly what Gloria needed. Finally, she feels the weight against her soldiers, its shoulders, literally from someone else, and feeling that she actually does have, you know, physical support from someone, and that someone actually does care about her and appreciate what she's doing, something that Gloria hasn't felt in a very long time. And with tears in her eyes, she goes to the restroom to clean up. They get down to heavy drinking. And for the first time, the sink finally turns on when she places her hands under the faucet. And the soap dispenser also senses her presence and works. And it's like something out of the Bible. I mean, it is an absolute miracle that it finally is working for her. But I got the sense that it's working because Gloria feels alive, like someone actually cares about her. Someone's actually made her feel better and hasn't completely just dismissed her like everyone else has. Finally, she has someone who does care and someone who is willing to give her the time of day and actually listen to what she has to say. And I think finally she's feeling alive in this scene, and that's what works so well here. Uh, but that's not the end of the episode because we get a very surprising appearance from Dollar. Yeah, remember the IRS agent? Well, he's actually back. He's arrived at his office and he discovers this large manila envelope in his chair, and it's a huge stack of papers and a flash drive, and 
The camera zooms in to show the top paper is labeled Stussy Lots LTD Accounts Payable Record. Who knows who said what to who, but this obviously is not going to be a good situation for Emmett. But that is the way this episode ends. Really incredible stuff overall. But let's just get this episode where it's going to take us into the finale. So, holy shit, guys. I mean, what an episode this really was. Uh, there really is a lot to talk about going on here. First of all, Gloria. Um, Gloria, in general, I really have loved... Um, like I said, you know, she started off the season. I wasn't a huge fan of her character. I thought that she was just a very basic sort of, you know, cop and that she was just going to be like something like Molly and things like that. But they really have done a lot with her here to show that that's not the case. She actually does have a distinctive character who just kind of wants to be noticed by society. And I feel like kind of writing her off as a genuine cop was what the show was trying to do in the beginning. That Yeah, she was just kind of that and we didn't really think much of her. But as the season's gone on, we really noticed that she just really just wants that to be noticed and now that she finally is and actually has someone who actually listens to her and actually you know seems to care about her well-being um it's just great to see i mean we know that glory hasn't had that in about four months and to know that you know winnie actually cares about her and just you know wants this is a genuine friend to her and wants to be a, you know this this friend to her that Glory just doesn't really have a lot. I thought it was just really effective. And Carrie Coon as well really amplified the emotion of that scene. I mean, getting Carrie Coon to play this role was such a great choice. And uh, it's just been great to see her this season. I've loved what we've seen of her here. Let's talk about Varga because, holy shit. I mean, Varga is a character that's been so intimidating and so creepy all season long between his bulimic teeth and his ruthless, just cunning attitude and his lawn monologues. But then you have Nikki, who outright has challenged him, and you can tell he is kind of afraid of. Like, there's never really been someone who hasn't been afraid of Varga, but for the first time, he is kind of afraid of her, and I think he does kind of have this feeling that maybe she can beat me. Maybe she does actually have what it takes, and I do think Nikki does. I mean, you know, vengeance is a, a bit, revenge is a bitch, really, and it can make you do a lot of things, and Nikki especially, I mean, it really does seem like she's not holding back, like she's willing to make Varga suffer as much as possible. Whether or not she actually is successful, that's really gonna be, you know, that's really gonna be up to what ends up happening in the finale, um, but I definitely am looking forward to seeing how this plays out. I love this sort of rivalry going on here, and I love that Varga is genuinely, you can tell, intimidated by her. Uh, Emmett's getting killed in the finale. I think that's definitely going to happen without a doubt. Uh, after everything that he's done, almost outing Varga, uh, confessing to everything, going against Varga's story, I doubt that he actually is going to survive. And I don't know if he's going to die at the hands of Varga, if it's going to be through Mimo. Um, but definitely, Emmett, I think, is definitely going to get it in the finale. There's no way that he's going to live um, after everything that's happened. I just don't possibly see that happening. The one question is Psy. Are we gonna see Psy in this finale? I know, of course, they said Psy basically, I don't know if he's brain dead, but they said that he probably is going to die soon. I don't know if we're actually gonna see him. We'll have to see really the way that all plays out. My one complaints with the season, I do hope we get an answer to it, is Yuri. I know, obviously, you know, Gloria did mention that he might have bled to death, but did that actually happen, or did he get away? I don't know if we're gonna get an answer to that. Again, I didn't you know, um, I don't have the amount of emotional care that I do for Gloria and Emmett, but that scene with Yuri really was making me starting to get a bit invested into his character, so I do hope they give us at least an update on what's happened with Yuri, and maybe we just see him for, like, one scene, even if it's just, like, one little scene, at least we will still see him. I do hope we do see that in the finale. I'm definitely just seeing how the finale really does play out. Uh, I've heard some really interesting things about it, that it ends a bit differently than I think it would, but that makes me even more hyped to see how it really does turn out. Overall, guys, I absolutely loved this episode. There were some just incredible things going on here. Just some well-deserved commentations, uh, well-deserved catharsis, definitely for Emmett. You can tell that Emmett is really starting to move past that grief. All of that guilt he's really felt for Ray. I think just by confessing it to Gloria, it's really just he's gotten that weight off his shoulders, and he's finally, um, you know, the cat's now out of the bag, and everyone knows now what's kind of going on, and even though Gloria knows what who the actual culprit is, um, 
I don't really know how this is going to go. And as far as uh, the, you know, as far as things go for Dollard, I don't know who contact Dollard or, you know, who said what, but definitely that's going to be interesting to see the way that plays out. And I don't think Em is just going to get away with this. I do think that someone is going to pay for what actually happened. You know, we do still have one episode, and it does seem like Glory and Winnie are not just going to give up. We'll have to see really the way that does play out. But overall, guys, I absolutely love this episode. I'm definitely going to give Fargo Season 3, Episode 9, Aporia, a 4.75 out of 5. Five or an A. So overall, guys, this episode of Fargo. Once guys saw this episode overall, loved your thoughts on it. I am absolutely loving this season. I can't wait to see the way that things do play out in the finale. Uh, but that's in my review, which also might be the last Fargo episode we get ever because there is, you know, talks that this might not be coming back. But that's in my review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in my next video. Like I said, it will be a finale, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.